Today on Newswatch, the Republican Party launches a new campaign to stop Donald Trump. But will it fuel more voter outrage and give Trump an even bigger boost? Plus, Iran's massive missile program. See how the Islamic regime is plowing ahead with its dangerous plans even after President Obama's nuclear deal. And I saw what happened to Jews in the 1930s and 1940s. And much of that same thing is happening to Christians now. There's an organized movement to, um, to demonize Christians. Why there's so much concern about the growing anti-Christian agenda in America today. Thanks so much for joining us for CBN News Watch. I'm Ephraim Graham. Fresh off Donald Trump's big Super Tuesday victory, establishment Republicans are set to launch an effort to stop him from winning the party's presidential nomination. And former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney is leading the charge. Gary Lane has more. Just four years ago, Donald Trump and Republican presidential nominee Mitt Romney appeared as political friends. It's my honor, real honor, and privilege to endorse Mitt Romney. But now there's bad blood. Romney is urging Republicans to support other candidates. Trump tweeted a blistering response saying, quote, looks like two-time failed candidate Mitt Romney is going to be telling Republicans how to get elected. Not a good messenger. The Republican race is apparently losing a candidate. That encouraged Ted Cruz, who believes he's the best candidate to stop Trump. On Wednesday, the Texas senator urged Republican voters to abandon their candidates and get behind him. If you've been supporting another candidate, we welcome you. That's also a message to supporters of Ohio Governor John Kasich, who has yet to win a state, and Marco Rubio, who has seen victory in only Minnesota. But at this point, neither Rubio nor Kasich are expected to drop out of the race. Rubio's home state of Florida is reportedly ground zero for a move by top Republican strategists and donors against Trump. The Washington Post reports they're planning to try to stop Trump from winning the GOP nomination, including using commercials against him. But it may be too little too late. Trump leads in the polls in Florida, and he's built up a lead in delegates heading into tonight's Republican debate in Michigan, another state where Trump is leading in the polls going into next Tuesday's primary. Gary Lane, CBN News. The Supreme Court heard the biggest abortion case in decades Wednesday, just a few weeks after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia. Protesters mobbed the court fighting over the case, which involves Texas abortion clinic regulations designed to protect women's health. The 2013 Texas law requires abortion doctors to have admitting privileges to nearby hospitals and for clinics to meet hospital-like safety standards. Opponents say the law's purpose is to block access to abortion, but Texas Solicitor General Scott Keller says it is about making women's health a priority. This case is not about overturning Roe versus Wade. What this case, the issue in this case, is can Texas enact valid patient regulations and improve safety? And when over 210 women annually are hospitalized due to abortion, Texas can. Whether the law stands or falls depends on Justice Anthony Kennedy. If he sides with the conservative judges, the court splits four to four and the regulations are upheld. If he sides with his liberal colleagues, the safety measures will be struck down. For more on the case, CBN News spoke with the Texas Attorney General. Hear what he said about how many women are rushed to emergency rooms after abortions every week in Texas. You can see that interview at CBNNews.com. Alabama is picking up the pieces after an F2 tornado struck Tuesday night, leaving at least four people injured. The storm damaged homes and buildings, including Grace Life Baptist Church. They were unable to hold their weekly service Wednesday because of extensive damage to the building. Ceiling tiles were blown out and the church's steeple ripped off. But the community did not let the storm keep them down. That's a real close-knit church. I mean, I know folks that go to this church and uh, they're big on faith. And if you're big on faith, then a little, a couple of shingles in your steeple falling off your church ain't gonna budge you. The church says they are keeping part of the steeple because it is meant to point to heaven. And they say they won't let the weather sway them from their mission. 
North Korea has fired six short range projectiles into the sea on the country's east coast. Officials in South Korea say the launches happened shortly after the UN Security Council approved the toughest sanctions on Pyongyang in two decades because of its recent nuclear test. Defense officials think the projectiles could be missile artillery or rockets. Well, you aren't hearing much about it here in the United States, but Iran is working hard on its missile program, and it could use it to launch nuclear weapons to threaten Israel, Europe, and even America. Iran says the United States won't learn how powerful its missile program is until it's too late. CBN's Chris Mitchell brings us the story now from Jerusalem. Iran's missile program is one of the most ambitious in the world. Its arsenal ranges from long-range ballistic missiles that could reach Europe, to shorter range missiles already used by regional terror groups against Israel and Saudi Arabia. Officially, the claim is that the missile industry is for defense purpose only. As for the uh, long range uh, missiles, it's obviously not a defensive uh, tool. The U.S. and five world powers lifted most of the international sanctions as part of their nuclear deal with Iran. The U.N. Security Council still called for work to stop on ballistic missiles that can carry nuclear weapons. Iran never complied and now argues its missile program has nothing to do with the deal. In addition, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani ordered an expansion of the missile program. Commander Ali Hajizadeh says Iran's Revolutionary Guard Corps will get two new advanced missiles when the Persian New Year begins in March. Both will have a range of more than 1,000 miles. Ayelet Savion is the Iranian expert with the Middle East Media Research Institute here in Jerusalem. She says from time to time, Iranian officials speak openly about the missile program. They kept saying that the main purpose of their uh, long-range missile was hitting, targeting Israel. Even with the nuclear deal in place, Iranian commanders taught the U.S. about their missiles and military capability. We have land to sea missiles with very heavy warheads located in tunnels along the Persian Gulf coastline. The Americans themselves once said that the IRGC Navy forces had dug over a thousand tunnels along the coast of the Persian Gulf. Ali Fadavi is the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy commander. When will the Americans learn about the things we haven't shown them? We will demonstrate this at a certain point in accordance with our interests or when the time is right. At that point, the Americans will know our abilities and it will be too late for them. Earlier, Iranian television revealed the missile tunnels saying they had around 500 of them. Almost all Iranian cities have at least one missile base. What you see is like an iceberg floating on the water, some part of which is only visible. We have so many such bases that even if they manage to identify some of them, it still will be to no avail. Savion says the admission of the tunnels has to do with regional tensions. I think they said it because of the tension being so escalating between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, they said we have hidden uh, cities of uh, uh, missiles. And it's not an idle threat. They also said that they equipped Israel's neighboring uh, Islamic movements, such as Hezbollah and uh, Hamas and other uh, Palestinian groups, such as Islamic Jihad, uh, with Iranian technology and missiles. Retired IDF officer Michael Segal says Iran is setting its sights high. They want to create some kind of a balance of power with the United States, with other European players. And if you, if Iran, Iran is on, on its way to become a superpower, and the missile program is indeed a pillar in the Iranian national security uh, doctrine. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Genocide is being waged against religious minorities in Syria and Iraq. That is the declaration from the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, which unanimously passed a bipartisan resolution. The measure says those who support mass murder and atrocities against religious minorities in the Middle East are guilty of genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. The genocide measure extends even to groups beyond ISIS. The declaration is considered a victory for religious minorities in Iraq and Syria. ISIS is, quote, spreading like cancer among the refugees from Syria and other countries who have fled to Europe. 
That is the word from a top NATO commander, U.S. Air Force General Philip Breedlove. He told the Senate Armed Services Committee, ISIS fighters are hiding among the refugees. He also said he takes ISIS at its word that they intend to attack the West, including the U.S., and they'll take the opportunity to infiltrate the refugees. Coming up, anti-Christian agenda, why one Jewish leader is comparing what's happening now with what happened to Jews before the Holocaust. An atheist group has sued a West Texas County and its sheriff for putting crosses on patrol vehicles. The Freedom From Religion Foundation filed a suit against Brewster County and Sheriff Ronnie Dodson to eliminate what they call exclusively Christian religious symbols on patrol cars. Sheriff Dodson says that decals are not a statement of religious preference, but that his deputies should be allowed to, quote, ask for all the help they can get. Some say American Christians are paranoid about feeling targeted and persecuted. But is there a chance there really is an anti-Christian agenda? Paul Strand talked to several people who are in a good position to know. Some of those on the front line of the culture wars say definitely there's an anti-Christian agenda. They feel it right in their face. I'm particularly sensitive to that because I'm Jewish. Brian Kamenker heads up the group and the website Mass Resistance. I saw what happened to Jews in the 1930s and 1940s. And much of that same thing is happening to Christians now. There's an organized movement to, um, to demonize Christians. What we're seeing very clearly is uh, an effort to uh, target them legally when possible, and then to uh, humiliate or deprive them of uh, social respect much of this comes from abortion rights and gay rights groups and their allies. They uh, see Christianity as, a, as refusing to affirm the things that they want to indulge in. Peter Sprigg is with the Family Research Council and Reverend Bill Owens with the Coalition of African American Pastors, both frequent targets of gay rights groups. They cannot accept any moral code which says that what they do is wrong. And uh, in order to uh, avoid any sort of uh, uh, guilt that might uh, come upon them. I if anyone says that what they're doing is wrong, they, they want to eliminate that kind of communication from the culture altogether. So there's a strong agenda to silence Christians. Uh, you see it every day. You, you can't walk out of your house and not see something anti-Christian. Gay and transgender rights groups have very carefully mimicked the civil rights movement. They have copied that movement, studied it, dissected it, and they knew exactly what to do. And one of the things they had to do was silence the Christian community. These folks point out one reason for the gay rights movement to co-opt the civil rights movement is because of how modern society sees opponents of civil rights. Narrow-minded, bigots, racists. They're hoping that their opponents will be seen through the same lens as narrow-minded bigots. And unfortunately, it's often Christians who are these modern-day opponents. If you disagree, you're a bigot, a hater, a racist, right? So you put that together, and it's a pretty powerful agenda. I suspect it's the minority of the left who actually believes it. But powerful, organized minorities often drive culture and politics in different ways. There are millions and millions of dollars behind the anti-Christian movement. We didn't have that. It started out with little people giving 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars. We often talk about this as a threat to religious liberty, and it is that. But if you really drill down, the, the religious liberty of Muslims and Jews and Hindus is not what's being attacked. It's the religious liberty of Christians. And it's not over. I mean, once now that they have gay marriage, they, they're doing their push to, uh, for these severe anti-discrimination laws to uh, punish Christians who don't go along with the agenda. And it's not that these folks just want a moral neutrality. Their new laws push a new morality. And the moral message they send is that it is morally wrong to disapprove of homosexual conduct. The left's idea is that to be a good person, you have to believe that the only thing in the world which cannot be changed is sexual orientation. They perceive Christianity as being a source of oppression. Uh, that's partly because 
they don't understand Christianity. They don't understand that uh, Christ came to set us free, not to imprison us. The problem now is that with the Supreme Court last year making gay marriage the law of the land, it supercharges the legal efforts that many Christians worry will more and more demonize the biblical beliefs they feel they must stand behind and thus be demonized themselves. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Up next, the vicious lie being spread about the state of Israel and the one woman who is determined to set the record straight. We'll talk with her coming up next. In the late 20th century, an international boycott movement helped to finally end South Africa's apartheid system. Today, Palestinians in the Middle East are gaining traction with a similar boycott campaign against Israel, even calling Israel an apartheid state. But is that a fair comparison? Many South Africans say no. Take a look. From 1948 to 1994, South Africa endured a rigid political system of racial segregation and discrimination against its black citizens. This system was called apartheid. Today, anti-Israel speakers are misusing the word apartheid to spread a lie that delegitimizes the state of Israel. Brick by brick, wall by wall, Israeli apartheid has to fall. Olga Meshua is a South African attorney and activist who says this characterization of Israel is false and makes a mockery of the struggle her parents and grandparents endured under apartheid. When I hear that Israel is an apartheid state, when people make that accusation, Depending on the mood that I'm in on the day, I either pack out laughing or I get really, really angry because it's an absolute lie. To counter that lie, Meshu travels the world speaking out in support of Israel. She's the CEO of DAISY, an acronym that stands for Defend, Embrace, Invest, Support Israel. And Olga Meshua joins us right now. Welcome to CBN News Watch. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Now, you saw apartheid in South Africa and why do you say Israel is not an apartheid state? Enlighten people. <laughs> because it isn't. <laughs> I mean, if you have a look at the legislation that was implemented during apartheid South Africa, what black people were not allowed to do, we were mm -hmm. not allowed to in any way, in any manner, interlink or intermingle with white people. We were segregated in terms of where we lived. We were segregated with regards to the schools that we went to. We couldn't enjoy public amenities such as the beach, going to movies, going to the mall. Um, my parents tell stories as to how they couldn't even go to the same restaurant as their friends. Mm -hmm. In fact, even today, even though apartheid ended 22 years ago, we are still bearing the scars of how black people were oppressed in South Africa. We weren't given opportunities mm -hmm. like other people were, particularly on the economic front. You go to Israel. On the bus, Jews sitting next to non-Jews. Mm -hmm. In the Knesset, Jews with non-Jews. Arabs are there. There is intermingling. Uh, people go to the same schools. If you want to speak, um, if you can speak Hebrew, you know, you can go there. And it's nothing that discriminates you with regards to, to your religion or the way that you look. And so it's actually wicked and it's a mockery to mm -hmm. call something that isn't an apartheid state an apartheid state. Even more so when Israel is pretty much the only true democratic state in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's an absolute lie. Yeah, painful to see. Your thoughts on this move to boycott Israel? Yeah. People need to understand what the true agenda is with regards to boycotting Israel. Mm -hmm. um, I many times challenge people and say, okay, if they really are interested in the well-being of Palestinians, because they say we need to boycott Israel so that the Palestinians can be free. Mm -hmm. But I ask you, what in fact are they doing for the Palestinians? We see so much money being poured into organizations such as the BDS, mm -hmm. predominantly in my country, and frankly, a lot of organizations in, in Israel and um, as well as in the West Bank and, and the Gaza Strip. And you then say, all right, how is that actually finding itself to the Palestinians? It's not. Mm -hmm. So they've got an agenda and pretty much to be blunt, that agenda is to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. And we're not allowed to, or rather we're not prepared to see that happen. And that's why we're standing up. Indeed, indeed. Now, you've been to Israel, I think, three times? Three times. Three times. Uh, when you are there, what do you see in terms of minority groups and how they're being treated? We see them being treated equally. We don't see Israel as a perfect place, but show me any nation in this world that's a perfect place. Yeah. She struggles with some of her policies. Um, one thing that people also need to distinguish between is the government of Israel at the time and Israel as a state. Mm -hmm. There may be policies, there may be decisions that we don't necessarily agree with. 
uh, that the Israeli government is doing, but that, that applies to every place mm -hmm. across the world, including in my own country. So what we see in, in Israel and our interactions with people in Israel, the minority groups, is that they love that country, they are privileged and they are proud to be associated with that country. Mm -hmm. In fact, many a times when you tell them about the BDS, they think that it's a tool by Israel mm -hmm. that's been implemented to make their lives more of a misery. They don't see it mm -hmm. as a liberation movement to free them. So... Um your organization is called DAISY. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what is your organization trying to do? What do you want to do? Well, we want to create platforms, and that's what we do, platforms of education, mm -hmm. so that people can be presented with the facts to make a decision for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we watch the media, not CBN, but we watch the media, <laughs> we read telephone, you know, we read newspapers, mm -hmm. and there's this a wicked bias with regards to just spreading lies about Israel. And so we want to help people see Israel for themselves to make their own conclusion. But also we as South Africans primarily and black South Africans also, mm -hmm. we want to educate people as to what we struggle through as a nation during apartheid and then be able to say, listen, guys, we went through apartheid. Mm -hmm. You're seeing what Israel's about. We're giving you facts as to what Israel's about. Make your own decision and don't be so gullible and yeah. deceived by what the nations of the world are saying. Indeed. Now you are here visiting Regent University mm -hmm. and on this campus. Tell us about your, your, your work here. So the BDS unfortunately seems to have gotten quite a strong stronghold on the university campuses mm -hmm. and so our work as Days International in the US at least at this point in time is twofold. One is to remind the Jewish community that they have friends in South Africa and across the world who are standing with them and who are supporting them. Mm -hmm. But secondly is also to raise an awareness of students on university campuses you know, university campuses are a place of learning, they're a place of getting information, that they should be using those institutions to learn and to gather information, and not just to be, with respect, puppets mm -hmm. that are being used for a cause that actually doesn't exist. So how do we help them to see the role that they can play um, in the, on university campuses with regards to coming against what BDS is doing. Beautiful. Olga Meshwa, thank you so much for thank being with us. Really me. appreciate your time. You can find more information about Olga's organization, Daisy, and her efforts to help Israel at our website. It's cbnnews.com. Stay with us. We're coming right back. Time now for your Thursday thankful. And today, as I stepped outside into a seasonably cold day following some unseasonably warm days, I didn't have the heart to complain. Instead, I was grateful. I thought, Lord, I am so glad for the cold in life. It only makes me feel and appreciate the warmth more deeply. Remember, everything has its season, and that is God's divine order. Take time to appreciate every single one, even those that may feel a bit colder than what's comfortable. That is going to do it for this edition of CBN News Watch. Remember, you can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBNNews.com. And take the time to tell us what you think about the stories you've seen here today. You can do it on Facebook or at CBN News on Twitter. Hope you'll join us again right here next time. It is Thursday. Take the time to make this a thankful one. We'll see you back here tomorrow.